Hey guys, it's Vic with High Desert Man, and we're doing another cigar review, and we're checking out a very cool product. You've already seen it on Kevin's channel. Now I have one. It's the Cigar Medics Humidimeter. We're going to talk about it in just a second. Hit the intro. All right. How's it going, everyone? Oh, I had, a, I had a busy day, and I got a call last night <clears throat> uh, after work. I was done working. I was sitting down for dinner, and I got a call uh, that I have to be in San Francisco Monday morning. Uh, it sucks. It really sucks. But um, So I'm going into town early tomorrow night. I'm hoping I get to meet up with my buddy uh, Mike Mansueto, who's part of the Patriarchal Smoke Group. And he's an old friend of mine. We, uh, we didn't play in a band together. He played in a band and I played in a band, but our bands have played together before. Um, anyways, he smokes cigars, so I'm hoping I get to meet up with him. Um, yeah, Tom from Cigar Medics uh, reached out to me. Well, Kevin reached out to me a few weeks ago and said, Hey, the dude from Cigar Medics wants to um, have you review the humidimeter. You mind if I give him your number? And I just got this in the mail a few days ago. It uh, it just comes in, you know, this standard sort of uh, bubble packaging. And um, it's, uh, okay, I gotta be completely transparent. I had told Kevin that this was really kind of a gimmicky and dumb tool. <laughs> and, uh, I, not dumb. I it's it's a cool. I I I think it's cool. It don't get me wrong. Um, and after having played with it for a couple days now, uh, I have thought of some uses for it and everything. Um, I'll get into why I didn't think it was such a uh, anything more than a gimmick uh, in a little bit. But um, first, let's talk about the cigar I will be reviewing. So a couple videos back, I met up with Mitch Smith at 21 Degrees Cigars in Scottsdale. And uh, he does some shows with the Bakersfield Gentleman, and he's a, he's a Bakersfield boy. And he was really cool and brought along five Alec Bradley cigars uh, for me to, uh, to, to give me. But one of them that he gave me was the Magic Toast, uh, which I thought was really cool. There was another one in there that is, I think he said it was a Cigars International only cigar. Um, so anyways, yeah, we're doing the Magic Toast. A Star is Born. Alec Bradley Magic Toast got its name on the night forever etched in my memory. That's the night I saw for myself by flashlight a crop that was beyond belief. Tobaccos I knew we would find a special project for. Under the stars, we cracked open a bottle of very special whiskey and proposed a toast to our future. Magic Toast was born that evening along with a ritual. Toast, toast the end of this cigar. Did I see that right? Toast the end of this cigar. Celebrate its beginning and enjoy the magic. Alan Rubin. It's supposed to be medium to full strength. It's offered in four sizes. A Robusto which is 5 by 52 at $8.95. The Toro which is this stick. 6x52, which comes in at $9.50. A Gordo, which is 6x60, uh, $10.25. And then more recently, they released something called the Chunk. The Chunk is a 4.5 inch long by 60 ring gauge uh, chunk of the Gordo, I guess, <laughs> at $9.25. <clears throat> Factory, it comes out of the Fabrica de Tobaccos Hoya de Nicaragua SA. And the blend on this stick is Honduran wrapper, Nicaraguan and Honduran binder, and Nicaragua Honduran filler. Two tobaccos listed for the binder. Does that mean it's a double binder? Perhaps. Oh, it's got a great, great aroma on the body. But I mean, it smells like it smells like a cigar. So, the humidimeter. 
What this is, is a device that measures the internal relative humidity of your cigars. And typically uh, devices uh, will measure the, the uh, actual humidity or moisture content, uh, but they do some magic in the, um, <clears throat> in the calculations and, and basically they calculate from the actual humidity what the uh, relative humidity would be. And uh, it's a, it's, you've seen Kevin use it, it's just a simple little tool. Now, I will say this. Uh, the instructions on the back. The humidimeter. This device measures relative humidity based on moisture content in the tobacco products and displays the percentage on the LCD screen. So operation, number one, remove the battery tab. Mine did not have a battery tab. It was, uh, I, you have to unscrew the battery cover to get to it. And while we're talking about the battery, <clears throat> Here's the, com the one uh, complaint I have right up front. The batteries, if I remember correctly, it uses four of those little pill-sized, uh, they used to be like uh, uh, watch batteries or something. This is a pretty small device and most of what's here is, is the, um, the electronics for figuring out the humidity. I wish they could have done this on something else you know maybe uh, one of the the same batteries that our sensors use in our humid uh, humidifiers in our humidors the Bovida Butler or the sensor push sensors or stuff you know that the quarter sized um, flat batteries <clears throat> I wish I could have used something like that because those are more readily available you can pick these up at Walgreens or whatever but it's just kind of a weird, weird battery size to use, and you need four of them. Uh, press the on button, and double zero percent sign will appear on the LCD display. Clean the probes with a dry cloth. Number four, place the cigar on a flat surface, uh, jab it with your thing, and whatever. Allow humidimeter up to five to ten seconds, as it will accurately calculate the display. Uh, and display the humidity percentage on the LCD screen. Uh, six, refer to the chart for general reference. Now, the chart is kind of cool. There's a little chart right in there. <clears throat> uh, relative humidity, 0% to 60%. The note is evaporation of natural oils, cracking or breaking of outer wrapper, fast burn, bitter taste. 60 to 70%, show or slow even burn and smoke, smooth even draw, optimal flavor and taste. So 60 to 70 percent is where you want to be. 70 uh, percent plus, difficult to draw smoke, uneven burn or tunneling, increased probability of mold. And then there's some other stuff there. Um, so let's uh, let's test this cigar that Mitch gave me. It's been in my uh, humidor now for. When did I meet up with Mitch? I met up with Mitch last week on Tuesday. So it's been a week in, in four days. Oh, I guess I should, I guess I should turn it on first. Zero, zero. And it started at 70, it dropped to 66, 65. 64, 62%. All right, so this cigar, re internal relative humidity is, uh, is at 62%. And uh, what the heck, I'll cut, I'll cut the uh, cap and then we'll measure the cap end of it and see what that's like. 73, 70, 71, 67, 66. Sixty-four, so two percent difference between the head and the foot. Mmm, good draw and really good flavor. It's got a sweet cocoa and coffee.
Yeah, the draw is great. The draw is really perfect on this. And uh, it's kind of a cool band. I was in a I was in a shop someplace uh, and saw some of these. Was it Fox? I can't remember where I was. Anyways, I skipped on it. This was this was a couple months ago. Hmm. Under ten bucks, nine fifty. It's fairly bold uh, right out of the gate. A lot of uh, just a hint of chariness. Just a hint of chariness right now. I'm I'm getting some uh, some cocoa. Hmm. Some cocoa, some dry wheat toast, and uh, maybe a little bit of uh, French press coffee. Pretty good. Pretty stinking good. All right, industry news. Found a really cool website. Uh, it's called NATO, uh, which stands for National Association of Tobacco Outlets. And this is a pretty cool website. The link is down below. You might want to uh, bookmark this link and, and check this place out once in a while. It's, it's pretty cool. Their tagline is working to protect the rights of tobacco retailers and adult tobacco consumers. Um, and uh, the one complaint I have about their website, uh, their website was, was functional and good and stuff, but it's not, uh, it's not, protected with encryption it's uh they're only they're, they they don't have a ssl certificate which means you don't see the little lock uh up in your browser and it says unprotected okay so they have a they have a couple maps small cigar maps large cigar map and this map which i hold in my little digits right here uh shows the taxes for uh, the the uh, all the states and it's pretty interesting because uh, looking at this map the, the taxes are an absolute mess uh, and th now this map is updated the information on the map that I printed out today uh, is current as of July 1st uh, 2019 this year so this is the taxes as of a few months ago I'm gonna go through all the states and uh, now, first, what I'll say is they've, they've got a table down here of, of what all the abbreviations are because there's CP, GR, IP, blah, blah, blah. So uh, CP is cost price, GR is gross receipts, IP is invoice price, MIP, manufacturer's invoice price, MLP, manufacturer's list price, MSP, manufacturer's sales price, WP wholesale price, WCP wholesale cost price, WPP wholesale purchase price, WSP wholesale sales price. That was listed twice, wasn't it? No, wholesale price and wholesale sales price. Okay, that's important, why? Because every state has a different tax based on that, based on one of those codes. And you can see how it would be very difficult to, well, I guess if you operate a, a shop in one of the states, then um, you just have to know it for your state. But Fox Cigar is, uh, uh, I don't know if I should say this or not, but Fox Cigar has plans to move out of Arizona to go into other states. And if that's the case, then they have the Arizona tax plus whatever other state they go into. Um, so anyways, it's, it's kind of a hassle. I'm just going to kind of shotgun through this real quick. Washington, 95% wholesale price. 95% of the wholesale price is, is their tax. So it's a very high tax, 
but it's based on the wholesale price as opposed to say the manufacturer's list price which would be a lot higher. Oregon, S oh, okay, 65% WCP, which was wholesale cost price. California, 62.78% wholesale, um, wholesale price. Arizona, this is one of the reasons I love my state. My state has fantastic gun laws. My state has awesome tobacco tax um, compared to most of the other states. 7.3% to 21.81 cents per piece. So, um, and according to Brad, I talked to Brad about this when, uh, when I went and saw him at Zeal Cigars here a couple weeks ago. Uh, he said that the price on large cigars is 25 cents per stick. So, we have a low, uh, a low tax. Utah, 86% of the manufacturer's a manufacturer sales price. Idaho, 40% wholesale price. Wholesale sales price. Montana, 50% wholesale price. Wyoming, 20% wholesale purchase price. Colorado, 40% manufacturer's listed price. So if the cigar lists for, uh, well, 10 bucks and 40%, you got an extra four bucks in Colorado uh, of tax on top of that. So the $10 cigar became 14 bucks. New Mexico, 25, 25% <clears throat> 25 wholesale price. Texas, Texas is really weird to, it says 0 0.75 to 1.50 uh, cents per piece. Now that does not, that cannot mean a cent and a half per cigar. Uh, I, I'm thinking it means 75 cents to a dollar fifty for a cigar, and what determines where it's at? I mean, that's a, a double range, right? From 75 times two is 150, so where's it at? Oklahoma is pretty good, 10 to 12 cents per piece. Um, Kansas, 10 percent wholesale sales price. Nebraska, 20 percent manufacturer sales price. South Dakota, 35 percent wholesale purchase price. North Dakota, 28% wholesale purchase price. Minnesota, 95% wholesale sales price. Iowa, 50% wholesale sales price. Missouri, 10% manufacturer's, what's MIP? Invoice price, manufacturer's invoice price. Arkansas, 68% manufacturer sales price. Louisiana, 8 to 20% invoice price. Alabama, 4.05 cents per place, per, per piece. So Alabama apparently has the best uh, tobacco tax on large cigars out of all of them. Florida, well, I, I, was, I spoke too soon. Florida has no tax. <laughs> That's what this says. No tax on the, on the cigars. Georgia, 23% wholesale cost price. Or, well, uh, yeah, wholesale cost price. Tennessee, 6.6% .6 wholesale cost price. Kentucky, 15% gross receipts. Indiana, 24% wholesale sales price. Michigan, 30% wholesale price. Ohio, 17% wholesale purchase price. Carolina, 5% manufacturer's price. North Carolina, or that was South Carolina. North Carolina, 12.8% cost price. Virginia, 10% manufacturer's sales price. Pennsylvania, no tax. Ooh, Pennsylvania's good too. The 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 growing areas, huh? Well, no, Florida's because th that's a, the, the uh, capital, of, uh, cigar capital of the U.S. Pennsylvania, they grow tobacco there. Uh, did I say Connecticut? Kentucky, they grow tobacco there, but there's 15% there. Connecticut is 50% wholesale price. New Jersey, 30% wholesale sales price. Delaware, 30% wholesale price. Maryland, 70% wholesale purchase price. DC, 70% gross receipts. Massachusetts, 40% manufacturer's sales price. New Hampshire, 65.03% wholesale sales price. Maine, 20% wholesale sales price. Um, Vermont, 92% wholesale, 
wholesale price or 92% wholesale price and or two to four dollars per piece per stick New York 75% wholesale price um, and there's a an adjusted adjustment ratio in in New York so um, so the taxes are insane and uh, the, I've got the link in the in the description below guys um, it's there's a lot of good information there they they have a link <clears throat> that uh, they have a page that describes the FDD, FDD, the FDA's, um, uh, what do they call it? Uh, significant equivalence uh, rule. So the the page, the website is meant for uh, retailers, and they do uh, large cigars, cigarettes, uh, small cigar, and e uh, vape, e vapor they call it, but e vape. Um, and they just it's just kind of a website to help educate um, retailers but there's some really good information on that page so um, I would suggest that you guys check it out because it's it's pretty cool stuff this is a pretty stinking good cigar Mitch thank you thank you for uh, giving me this cigar this is pretty awesome Not really getting any transitions. It's pretty much staying um, cocoa. The coffee has picked up a little bit. I am getting um, more of a coffee note off of it now. And I'm also getting a, a uh, oak, an oak or a mahogany, something that you would grill with, that, that you would smoke uh, meat with. And I'm still getting that dry wheat toast. So, uh, yeah, hasn't really transitioned much. Let's go on to the miscellany, shall we? It is time for... Rugged Random Tips. The moon was high, the sky was low, but we were all alone. Just her and I. I don't know how, but I did my best placing my hands upon her breasts. I'm through. I'm finished now. My first experience of milking a cow. Current events in tech. Google, Apple, and Amazon are all betting pretty large right now on something that is called ambient computing. Um, that's not the name that you've heard used. Uh, what, you've, what, what has been advertised and uh, promoted to the consumer is all these new fancy sensors that make integrate more with your life and fit more into, your, uh, into our uh, daily rituals or our daily routines is what I should say. I'll give you an example. The uh, uh, Amazon's uh, Alexa thing, all right? It's got a mic in it. You say, hey, Alexa, play some music, and uh, she starts playing some music. This is an example of ambient computing. Ambient computing is, the idea behind it is um, that technology, uh, through the use of various sensors and stuff, um, becomes interactive and aware of the presence of a person uh, with, within a vicinity of that device. So with Alexa, it, it's your voice. Uh, Google has a new, uh, I don't remember what they call their assistant device, kind of like that, but uh, they've got one where you just kind of move your hand over it and it lights up uh, the uh, volume up and down buttons and, and th those are just capacitive touch buttons uh, not actual physical buttons but uh, you just kind of move your hand over it, it lights them up and then you can go up or down stuff like this. Uh, the, the sensors in your in your phones that now can tell um, you know when you've got your phone sitting on its face which uh, tells the phone do not disturb 
uh, if you flip it over, it'll light the screen up and show you um, show you your notifications and stuff. And that works off of uh, both the light sensor and um, gyroscopics, right? T turning the phone over and stuff. So these companies are betting large right now on, on this stuff to make all these devices uh, from speakers to the, the Nest um, thermostat devices and the Nest uh, uh, smoke detectors. So here's a, here's a pretty good quote about ambient computing. I couldn't find who said this quote. It was in an article I read and they didn't quote who it is, but this is, uh, this is from someone, not me. <laughs> the ambient paradigm consists of many devices providing different input-output methods that can be flexibly utilized depending on the situation, whether you're sitting, walking, running, driving, <coughs> and, and provide uh, feedback and, and usefulness to you and stuff. So there's a lot of pros to this. There's a lot of cons, in my opinion, to this. Um, obviously, these things are being uh, marketed to us to give us, uh, just to, like I said, to fit into our daily routine. So it's like uh, when you get, when TV's got remote controls, right? Now you don't have to get up and go flip the channel. You can just uh, hit the flicker, as people, or the clicker, my dad always called it. The cons. I think there's a list of cons uh, to be to be noted. Uh, first of all, crap don't work. All right, and we we have been we have been lulled into a an existence where we just accept things not working correctly. And this is why I feel like I was born in the wrong century. I wish I was born. Uh, in the industrial age because it would be a lot cooler to work with big heavy steel gears and, and mechanics and stuff that that just works and the reason why it doesn't work is because something physically broke as opposed to my freaking phone not uh, you know not bringing up the thing swiping up uh, unless I drag all the way from the bottom to the top which is a problem that my phone has uh, not all the time, but it's it's something I run into, and we run into uh, little crappy issues on our computers and stuff all the time. On on, oh, I got an example for you. You've probably noticed, or maybe you haven't noticed, in my past several videos, I've not been wearing my Fitbit watch. This is the new, latest uh, Fitbit. What did they call it? Uh, the the Versa. I think it's Fitbit's latest watch. Uh, I bought one for my wife and for myself. Uh, the two of them were somewhere in the area of 400 bucks. And, <clears throat> and it was pretty cool. Uh, however, right outside of the warranty period, my Fitbit, well, the battery's gone dead because I haven't been wearing it, but uh, uh, my Fitbit got to where I couldn't swipe the screen and it, it would it would start to pull over like it was going to the next screen but it wouldn't work and stuff and then if I pushed hard and like pushed hard and dragged across then it would go to the next screen but then eventually even that stopped and when I called Fitbit about it the best Fitbit could offer me now mind you I was outside my warranty when I called them on this this was like a month and a half ago or something uh, I was outside my warranty by like a week. That was it. The best that they could offer me was a discount on um, either the Versa or their higher end one. Uh, and, and they were going to give me like 150 bucks off or something like that. I can't remember. They wouldn't fix my... Now, that's not the, that's not the only issue. My wife's had the same issue, but hers started acting up within the warranty period. Uh, she sent it back. They sent her a new watch and everything. Uh, so it's just a matter of time uh, because I got on the Fitbit forums and on online and stuff. Turns out a lot of people are having that problem because this piece of crap doesn't freaking work right. And they released it uh, under the guise of, hey, it's a great new watch and it's got all these freaking features and stuff. Uh, the other more important uh, issue is... Our privacy has completely degraded. Now, people get tired of hearing privacy, and when you bring up, uh, oh, we don't have any privacy, you typically get 
one of two extremes. You get the people that are freaked out by it and are like, no, I don't have a phone. I, I use a flip phone and I don't have any of those gadgets in my house or whatever because I don't want uh, any of that crap. But they don't realize that they're still giving up a lot of stuff on their Facebook account or whatever. Or you've got the people, and this one's even more maddening, uh, that say, well, I don't have anything to hide. Uh, so I'm not, you know, I, everything I post, I, I don't care about which is wrong, wrong, wrong. Why? I'll tell you why. Because it, it doesn't matter the information that you know about that you're putting out there. What matters is the metadata. You hear this term metadata, right? And think of metadata as this. What's the best way to describe it? If if I get on my computer and I go to some website, that website knows what IP address I came from. And they know what region I came from because IP addresses are doled out to regions in, in allotments, right? So my region, and they're also doled out uh, per service provider. So uh, the, the, the website knows that my service provider is MTE and they know what region I'm in because of where my IP uh, came from, I go onto that website and I start looking at whatever, some electronic stuff. Now they've, they're getting the information of, oh, you're looking for this. And we've all experienced this because as soon as you go on YouTube and watch one or two videos on some subject, all of a sudden YouTube starts throwing those videos at you a lot, right? They start suggesting this stuff to you. But it's, I can't even articulate how the breadth of, of what metadata reveals about you and stuff. So our privacy is, is out the window. Ultimately, in my opinion also, this stuff causes more stress and more little uh, misfires of our synapses and stuff, uh, which leads, I think, to long-term uh, uh, physiological issues with with people but you don't really understand how this stuff over long term long term but we're talking probably a short study would be 20 years I am having a little bit of trouble with this cigar uh, going still it, I mean it, it I, I have to double and triple draw on it each time I feel like I'm working it pretty good But anyways, so uh, I had a point to that. I, I don't remember what my point was, though. But anyways, ambient computing. That's uh, something you might want to look up and, and do a little reading on. And uh, we'll be back in just a little while, guys, after I smoke this down a ways. Stick around. Folks, I'm here to tell you this is a good cigar. And... What stands out most about this cigar? It's about as close as you can get to eating a chocolate bar. This thing is crazy sweet relative to cigars. Man, it's got a thick, oily wrapper. The wrapper is just, it's really oily. It says it's Honduras. Um, I, wish it, I wish there was more information on it, but... Uh, Really interesting cigar. It didn't transition until <clears throat> about the halfway point, and then for about three minutes, it was like I was drinking chocolate milk. It was chocolate milk I was getting out of this. It was crazy. Now, <clears throat> the, the little bit of cocoa that I mentioned at the beginning transitioned in and just kept getting sweeter and more like a mix of cocoa and then uh, starting to lean into dark chocolate once in a while. And then for that little bit, it was like chocolate milk. Um, the only issue I've had with the cigar is I, it's been a struggle keeping this thing going. I've had to, I've really had to pay attention to it. I've had to uh, take the lighter and uh, correct the, uh, it, it just keeps burning on the inside and the wrapper doesn't burn much. 
probably because of all those oils. Uh, I think this cigar would age pretty well. It's got a lot of dark earth flavors. Um, it's really smooth. Still getting a little bit of that dry wheat toast on it. That's been pretty consistent. Um, the wooded notes, the, I guess the wooded notes are still there a little bit, but not as much. It's just uh, deep, rich earth and, uh, and a mix between cocoa and chocolate. This is a really, really good cigar. Recommended podcasts. And I just finished one today that, uh, actually I just started yesterday and finished it today. It was an eight part series and it was really, really fascinating. It's another Wondery one and it's called Business Wars. Now there's a whole bunch of stories on Business Wars. Uh, the one I finished today was uh, the battle between Netflix and Best, uh, Blockbuster, the whole battle that that uh, took place at the very onset of Netflix. You know, Netflix only used to do the uh, the DVDs that you could rent uh, through the mail and stuff, and then send them back and stuff. And then I think it took them like ten years to get a good streaming service and stuff. But it 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 just lays out the whole story of the battle and the the. Uh, Netflix and Blockbuster both had each other on the ropes a couple times and it, it could have been anyone's game and it really just came down to uh, Blockbuster making making uh, a bad decision and uh, and we know how that went <clears throat> but uh, really interesting like I said it's an eight-part series and it transitioned at the end to the battle between Netflix and HBO and now, right now, Netflix is the is the 800-pound gorilla that everyone is trying to. They're they're so far beyond any other streaming service, and and but it kind of lays out the the growth and the progression of the cable companies and and just everyone putting in their input on streaming uh, streaming services and stuff. And a really fascinating story. But there's a lot of, I'm starting one today that's on uh, the WWF versus WCW. Um, I'm not a, a, I guess you call it professional wrestling. I'm, I'm not a fan of that stuff, but uh, it, it sounds like a pretty interesting story. So that's the one uh, I recommend for you this time. It's a good cigar, guys. If you haven't uh, if you haven't tried the Alec Bradley Magic Toast yet, you got to get it. It's it's really now body wise. It's it's pretty full bodied. Uh, it even had a, a, quite a bit of creaminess. <clears throat> the creaminess played into that sweetness that I was getting and stuff. Um, it's not creamy like you typically would get off of uh, like a Connecticut shade but there's a creaminess there. Um, wow, just a really good stick. And something tells me that this would be a really good cigar to age for uh, a long period of time. All right, guys, that's it. Hope you liked the video. Um, share it with your friends if you would. Hit that like for me and uh, subscribe. Hit the bell so you know when I do new videos. I'm still trying to figure out my routine, but my routine is pretty much settling on Mondays and Thursdays. And I've got another idea that I'm working on for a live stream. I want to start doing a regular live stream, but I don't know uh, when or how that's going to take place. But um, yeah, until the next video, guys. Stay rugged. <laughs>